Uh, we're looking at the book of Acts, and uh, we're looking at uh, chapter 8 this morning. Uh, kind of to get where we're at. Um, chapter 4, the church in the uh, presence of uh, Peter and John has its first encounter with the Jewish officials. The first negative encounter. Acts 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira who lie to the Holy Spirit, lie to God about what they're doing. So there's internal problems that are happening in the church. You also have in chapter 5 uh, another encounter with the Sanhedrin that seems to involve all of the apostles. So you're having conflict outside and inside the church. Chapter 6, there is the conflict within the church because the Grecian widows seem to be neglected. And the Grecian wid widows will be called Hellenistic Jews. Uh, and it's quite possible that they were neglected because they didn't speak Hebrew. So the solution was to appoint seven men who we call deacons to take care of this problem. Two of those guys were Stephen and Philip. Stephen is stoned in chapter 7. Um, again, this is conflict from without. Chapter 8 opens with Saul, uh, who will become the Apostle Paul, but he has set out to destroy the church or to destroy the Christian movement. And he's described as a young man. And this may be trivia, but you notice that in the synagogue of the freedmen, it is mentioned the region of Sicily or Cilicia. Where's Paul from? He is from Tarsus, which is in the region of Cilicia. So might he have been one of the people that was debating with Stephen? And maybe this is why he is so adamant against the church. I just throw that out there. You know, that's that's a trivia stuff. Um, with the with he is described as a young man, and this may have an age range of twenty four to forty. Uh, at, at least, and so at least the Hellenistic part of the church was dispersed. And using the word dispersed kind of connects the Christian dispersion with the Jewish diaspora. So, he searches from house to house. He arrests both men and women and imprisons them. Now, this, this imprisonment here is not like what we think of imprisonment today. Uh, if you're arrested, you're put in prison for or jail for a little while, then you go to trial. And then you may be imprisoned again as punishment. Well, that wasn't the way this worked. You were imprisoned. You went to trial. You were freed, maybe. Maybe you were freed after a beating. Or you were executed. 
no going back to prison for punishment. Does that make sense? So this is what Paul is all about. Later in his writings, like 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, he has things to say about he was the least of the apostles because he persecuted the church of God. In Acts 26, 11, he will say he compelled people to blaspheme. And maybe he had some serious dealings with that. So this possibly occurred sometime between 32 AD and 35 AD. Uh, you know, the dating there gets kind of fuzzy when you look at different, different people. So the scattering of the Hellenistic Jewish Christians. So it starts that second part of Acts 1-8. Acts 1.8 says that the gospel is to start in Jerusalem. And it is to go to Judea in Samaria and then to the other most parts of the world. And you can use Acts 1.8 as an outline for the book of Acts. Acts 1 through 7, pretty much Jerusalem. Uh, 8 through about uh, uh, chapter 12, and you get a little fuzzy there because of chapter 10 and 11. You're in uh, Judea and Samaria. And then starting with uh, chapter 12 and forward, uttermost parts of the world. But you have an interesting story in chapter 8 that kind of takes you to the end of the world, too. So Philip is, uh, was one appointed to take care of the Grecian widows. That role is not going to be prominent in his life right now. He is moving on. He is with the scattered church so he goes into Samaria <laughs> and he is engaged in telling the story of Jesus now uh, our Bibles depending on which version you use it either says the city of Samaria or a city of Samaria and if it is the city of Samaria, then it was the capital, the ancient capital of the northern, northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, and at that time, it was called something like Sebasti instead of uh, Samaria. That was the name that Herod the Great gave the city. And if it's in a city, just any city, uh, in the region of Samaria, uh, it's perhaps what is called Neophilus or the ancient city of Shechem. So we don't know uh, about that. Uh, I think my version uh, says it was the city of Samaria. Uh, New International Version, I think, says a city of Samaria. Yeah. Uh, a city in Samaria. Okay. The important part here is that Philip proclaimed Christ. And uh, one commentator I was looking at pointed out some uh, different language that was used to tell the story of Philip preaching. He proclaimed Christ, uh, and then later on, 
he, whoops, I forgot where it was at. He proclaims the good news about Jesus. And um, so there's different words that are used of what Philip is doing. But he is teaching about the Christ. Now, Samaritans and Jews did not have a good relationship for the most part. The tradition is that the Samaritans, first of all, you've got to think about this. When the kingdom split, what did King Jeroboam the first do? Come on. What did he do? Yeah, two places actually, but one at Dan and one at Beersheba. So this place of worship was corrupt. It involved a golden calf. But yet it was still purported to be the worship of Yahweh. Jeroboam the first. So you have this problem. Then, when the northern kingdom is destroyed, the Assyrians bring in other conquered peoples and settle them in the land. They intermarry with peoples that were left there and form this mixed race, the Samaritans. Or that's generally the way um, we look at the Samaritans and the, and then when the Southern Kingdom comes back from their Babylonian captivity and starts rebuilding the temple and the walls, uh, there's conflict with those others, uh, people that were left in the land. And then there are other issues, the temple at Mount Gerasim and the temple at Jerusalem. And they uh, have a tendency to defile each other's temple and whatnot. So all of this has been going on. And there is a serious problem in the relationship between Jews and Samaritans. Now, um, if you consult some biblical literature, you're going to find another explanation for the origin of the Samaritans. I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't understand it completely, but um, just know that it's out there. So, um, so why would the Samaritans at this time hear Philip, but they wouldn't hear another Jew. And there's possibly three reasons. Uh, <clears throat> there's possibly uh, a three reasons. He was a Hellenist or he was Grecian. So he was a little bit already outside of the Jewish element. He was persecuted by the officials of the Jews, the Sanhedrin. And then perhaps, and I happen to like this idea better than maybe the others, Jesus had an encounter with a Samaritan in a Samaritan village called Sychar in John 4. And there were several people that responded to him at that time. So maybe someone 
coming and telling them about Jesus would resonate because of that event that took place in John chapter 4. So along with his preaching, he performed signs. He cast out demons. He healed the paralyzed and the lame. And there was much rejoicing in the city. They heard the good news of the gospel. Demons were cast out. Those that were infirmed, at least the lamed and the paralyzed, were cured. So there was much to rejoice about. Starting with uh, verse 9, there is the story of Simon Magnus, or Simon the Sorcerer. Uh, he was a magician. Magic plays a special role in the book of Acts. In chapter 8, we deal with Simon Magnus. In chapter 13, in chapter 19, and in chapter 16. In uh, those chapters, we have the story of Halimus, a Jewish uh, magician. And he tries to keep a, a certain official from hearing about Jesus. Paul blinds him. In chapter 19, you have the story of the seven exorcists the sons of Sceva, who uh, use the name, the name of Jesus and Paul, because at least in the thought of magic of that day, if you have the name, then you can use its power. And so these exorcists go in to cast out a demon, and the demon says, we know Jesus and Paul, but who are you? And the demon beats all, uh, the demon possessed man beats all seven of them up. And then in Acts 16, there is a demon possessed girl who has the spirit of divination. And I'm going to call that magic. And her owners are making money because she can do this. She starts following Paul around and, and speaking about what he's doing. And he casts the demon out. And of course, he winds up in the jail. So magic plays, or at least writings about magic. Uh, play a prominent role in, and there's one other passage, I, I, I don't know where this one's at, but it talks about uh, a group that have been converted and they burn their books of magic that's found in the, in, in the book of Acts. So there's much rejoicing in the city. There's Simon Magnus, and he had proclaimed himself to be someone great. Either he proclaimed it or the people proclaimed him to be someone else, someone great. And there's a couple of ways of looking at this. He might have been saying that he was a representative of God. Or using the word power as it is used in the book of Ephesians, powers, um, I think it's Ephesians 2, powers is a rank 
of angels. So it may be thought that he was saying he was some sort of an angel. Now, whether he said this about himself or the people said it about him, doesn't really matter. He had held sway over the people in Samaria, in this village. Now, there's all kinds of legends that develop about this man later, but we'll maybe say something about that later. He had, an, he had a following. The occult attempts to defeat Christianity or Christianity defeats the occult. And that's still true today. And we kind of say, um, or at least we have been known to say, uh, well, that doesn't, that stuff doesn't really happen. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm not sure anymore. Um, you have Wiccan cults. It's very prominent today. You have other pagan religions that, um, you know, and they may have some power there. So the men and women believed and were baptized. Simon believed and was baptized. Now, get this in mind. Simon believed, he was baptized, he continued with Philip. Continued with Philip. <clears throat> So in verses 14 through 25, verses 14 through 25, Peter and John come from Jerusalem. Now, we're told here that, um, that the church in, uh, in Samaria had not received the Holy Spirit, or that they went down so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So doesn't that throw a monkey wrench into Acts 2, where Peter has said, repent, be baptized, receive the forgiveness of sins, and receive the Holy Spirit. Probably what is meant is that the infant church in Samaria had not received the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Had not received the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. But that they were completely converted, they were completely Christians, but Peter and John came down to impart these gifts. Now, let's, let's just play some, you know, you know, we've noted before in this class that Peter and John are often together at the last Passover that Jesus celebrated, Peter and John fixed the meal. Peter and John are together when the, when the lame man is healed in Acts 3. Peter and John are together 
here. So they're uh, companions. In Luke 9, 54, John, with his brother James, wanted to call fire down on the Samaritans because they didn't want Jesus and his group to pass through. So there's been a change in John and his attitude toward the Samaritans. So there's, there's reasons for uh, the apostles coming to give the infant a uh, church in Samaria the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands to show that the apostolic church in Jerusalem approved of the Samaritans coming in. You will have a meeting like this in Acts 11, where it is discussed and the officials of the church approve of the Gentiles coming into the church. Ultimately, this is to promote unity between the Samaritan and the Jewish factions within the church. This is much like the Acts 15 council, if you will. You've got to have unity between Jew and Gentile for the church to work. You've got to have unity between the church, you know, the church body for it to work and to promote, promote the idea of Jesus. At this point, Simon sees what the apostles do by imparting the spirit and the miraculous gifts. By the way, we're not told what the miraculous gifts are in this in this passage. Um, probably, and notice I said probably, probably the gift of speaking in tongues was involved. And the reason I say that, it happened in Acts 2. It happens in Acts 10. It happens in Acts uh, uh, where the Ephesians uh, are, are, didn't write it down. Uh, the Ephesians are rebaptized by Paul. There is the gift of speaking in tongues. So perhaps this is what fascinated Simon. But anyway, we're not told what gifts were given. Um, there's an interesting word that develops because of this in the middle, uh, the medieval church. It's called simony. And simony was the gift of uh, somebody bought a church office. And so it was called simony because of this incident in Acts chapter 8. So Simon wants to buy the ability to impart the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. So at this point, we asked a question. Was Simon really converted? Uh, was he converted, but in a moment of weakness? enamored by the power that he once held over these people. Did he think, I can do this again? And um, so, again, let's, let's, let's think about this for a little bit. 
In Acts 13, Acts 8, 13, it says he believed. Acts 8, 13 says he was baptized. Acts 8, 13 again says he followed Philip. All indications that he was truly converted. Okay? All indications that he was truly converted. Now, those that argue that he was not truly converted point to what Paul and uh, Peter tells him to do in verse, look at verse 20. Uh, so Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of wickedness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answers, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. And those that argue that he wasn't generally, uh, wasn't genuinely converted will say that he threw this back into Peter's lap and said, you pray for me, but pray that none of these bad things will happen to me. He didn't really ask. He didn't follow the instructions that Peter gave him. He was only concerned about the bad things that were possibly going to happen to you. Now, it's interesting that the words are found in um, verse 21. You have no part or share in this are similar to the words that Jesus says to Peter in John chapter 13, verse 8, when he comes to wash his feet. And Peter says, no, you're not doing that. And Jesus says to him, unless I do it, you have no part or share in me. Words are similar. So that might be an argument against that he wasn't genuinely converted because Peter was genuinely converted, but just thought Jesus shouldn't be washing his feet at the time. However, there's a whole lot of mythology. I think I'm correct in using that word uh, that develops around Simon Magnus. He becomes known as an arch heretic. And he has run ins with Peter and Caesarea, Antioch, and Rome. Um, and he is even declared to be the source of Gnosticism. So you can go read about that on your own, uh, but just know that that's out there. So Peter and John return to Jerusalem. They go on a preaching tour through the Samaritan territory and they return to Jerusalem. Philip is continuing in Samaria, but an angel appears to him and tells him to take a trip. To take this trip 
on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Gaza is the ancient Philistian city. It was destroyed sometime around 1893, uh, not 1893, uh, 93 to 96 BC. And then there was a new city of Gaza built that was a little further south, I think. Um, and there, Philip comes upon a chariot. And in this chariot is an official. The treasurer of the Candace of Ethiopia. Now, let's do some thinking here. The Ethiopia of the New Testament mentioned here is not the modern country of Ethiopia. It is a country that extended from, I can't pronounce the name, Aswan in modern Egypt to Khartoum in Sudan. It had uh, major cities, Napata, and Moreau. Moreau had another name in the Old Testament. Sheba. So this was the territory that the queen of Sheba came from. Mentioned in 1 Kings 10. Now, this would have been a journey of a thousand to a thousand five hundred miles from this area to Jerusalem. It may have taken as much as a couple of months. Okay. So this official had been to Jerusalem to worship. Now, if Jewish law was truly being enforced, if Jewish law was truly being enforced about where this man could go in the temple, And the word eunuch actually means eunuch in the sense that parts of the male body were removed. Then he could only go as far as the court of the Gentiles. He couldn't go into the court of Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, 1 and 2 is one of the passages in the Old Testament that would support that idea that <coughs> any further. So, Philip comes upon him. He's reading <coughs> Isaiah 53. He's reading aloud. And Philip hears what he's reading and he asks, do you understand what you're reading? And this is his approach to proclaiming to this man the gospel. Now, as I said earlier, uh, in Mediterranean legends, Ethiopia was considered to be the very end of the earth. So, what did our outline say in Acts 1-8? That the gospel was to go to the end of the earth. 
So in this passage, that starts. That starts. So he preaches to him, starting with Isaiah 53. Do you suppose he read through that they continue to read Isaiah and came to Isaiah 56, 1 through 8, where it talks about that the eunuch can be accepted? Maybe. So, they come to a spot where there's water, and the eunuch asks to be baptized. Acts 8.37 is not in most modern translations. He is baptized. He is goes on his way rejoicing. Philip suddenly finds himself in Azotus. And uh, I think that literally means that he was here and he was there. Uh, there was no travel to it. He just was there. Oh, Azotus is the Old Testament city of Ashdod. And uh, he goes on to Caesarea Maritima, which is 50 miles north of Azotus. And that is an important city because of Acts 10 1, where Cornelius is located. 20 years or so later, we find that Philip is still here with his four daughters. Okay, our time has run out. So we're stopping. <laughs>